All right, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here. Um, and welcome to those of you both in the room, but also online or watching this as a subsequent recording as well. And on behalf of the NCAR Fellows Association Professional Development Committee, wanted to welcome you to part two of this conversation of overcoming obstacles in the publication process. And two weeks ago, we had perspectives from early career scientists and now we will have perspectives from more senior scientists who serve as both editors and reviewers of peer-reviewed manuscripts as well. So this morning we have uh, doctors Scott Ellis, Olya Wilhelmi, and Glenn Romine. And what I'm gonna do is um, ask them to, from left to right, and we'll start with Scott, uh, we'll have them introduce themselves, um, share their editorial experience, and also uh, kick off with the first question of what are some of the the quick the quick spark notes, if you will, or highlights of good and bad um, things that authors can do in the publication process. And then after that, we'll open up to questions both from the audience and also the chat room as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming them. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, it's a real honor to, to be here and talk to you. Uh, my name is Scott Ellis, as you know, and I've uh, started NCAR in the, what was then the Atmospheric Technology Division, is now EOL, in 1997. Um, so I've been here quite a while, and uh, I'm an associate editor for the Journal of Atmospheric uh, Applied Meteorology and Climatology, excuse me, GMC. And I've been doing that for five or six years now. I can't quite remember how long. Um, and so it's my pleasure to be talking to you. And uh, my little spiel is gonna be a little bit uh, more broad. So I was thinking generally about this and, and it's gonna sound a little bit obvious. My wife always says I have a flair for the obvious. So excuse me if this is, seems a little bit silly, um, but uh, you know, we're all scientists and, and our, our goal really is doing good science. And the publications that we produce are a part of that process but they're not the end goal. And, and so a lot of times I've, I've been talking with people and they really are focused on the number of publications that they're gonna put onto their CV. And I think that's a real danger. Um, I think that the goal should be the science and the, and the good science that you do. And if you do good science, you can publish it. Um, and, and so there's a real risk at, at overemphasizing the number of publications. Um, but going on to say that publishing is, is a really serious part of our enterprise of doing science. And without peer review publications, our enterprise doesn't exist. And so I encourage all of you to take it very seriously, whether you're a reviewer, eventually an editor, or, or a, a pub, you know, publisher you're publishing. Um, this is really serious and, and you know, when I see publications coming in and you can tell they're trying to get something through and it's not serious, it's not in depth. Um, that just, that kind of reduces the value of, of the publication for all of us. So I was talking with a, a young group of, of students a long time ago and, and they were talking about the LPU, the least publishable unit. And I didn't tell them this, but it, it really upset me because they were, they were joking around Sort of, right? So they were talking about, well, I can get three publications out of this study instead of one. And so this bothered me. And so I, I was thinking of an example, sorry to go on a little bit. But how many of you have heard of the Madden Julian oscillation? MJO, right? Have you read Madden and Julian's paper? <laughs> this is a huge, in depth, profound publication. And it's with a data set, and they could have gone for the LPUs, right? They could have chased the LPUs and got three publications instead of this one. And none of you would have ever heard of Madden and Julian or the MJO. This is a transformative, you know, serious publication. And it, and it impacted the field in a way that it created a new field. Um, there are people who spend their careers studying the M MJO. And, and it started with this publication. So I think if you chase the LPUs, you might end up really limiting your impact and limiting your science. So focus on, my advice is focus on the science first and, and, and then you'll be able to publish it. Um, and that's the goal. 
um, and, and try to avoid the trap of number of publications for my CV. So that's my, uh, and, and as an editor and a reviewer, you can see when people have, 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 are just trying to push some, some publication through that's very similar to what they've done before. You've got a story to tell with your science, tell it, and you will be rewarded for that. So that's my spiel. Um, yeah, so thank you for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. So I'm Oli Wilhelmi. I've been at NCAR for 20 years. I started you know, as an ASP postdoc in 1999. And uh, now I'm project scientist in RAL, and I also um, lead the uh, GIS program here at NCAR, which stands for Geographic Information Systems. So I've been a reviewer for all those years. I've been an author all those years. And I also uh, served as an editor for Weather, Climate, and Society. It's an AMAS journal. It's an interdisciplinary journal that combines um, the research from physical and social and behavioral sciences. And so the work that publish, uh, uh, Weather, Climate, and Society publishes addresses really like a broad set of topics. But uh, the key there is interactions between um, weather, climate, and society. And uh, I was an editor for three years between 2015 and 2018, and it's been a really invaluable experience. Um, and just kind of, you know, to start off this conversation, I would say, you know, I've been on the author's shoes and the reviewer's shoes and the editor's shoes, and I would say, you know, the probably first and foremost thing you can do is to treat others with respect. Um, and don't take things personally. Because, you know, the, the ultimate goal is peer review, as Scott mentioned, it's such a critical part of scientific enterprise, and we have peer review process to make sure that the science that gets published is robust, um, is accurate, um, and it's, you know, actually worth pub of the publication. And so, again, sort of it's a golden rule, treat, you know, treat others like you want to be treated. So if you are writing a paper, just think about the people who will be reading this paper. Make their job easy. Connect your research questions to <coughs> approach, to methods, to results, to conclusions. Make sure your conclusions are supported by the evidence you're presenting. And make the reviewer's job as easy as possible. <clears throat> you know, because good, good organized papers, you know, are really helpful because if reviewers and editors have to look for things in your paper and really try to connect the dots, that just, you know, raises a lot of questions. So again, you know, like if, if you can sort of think about like who's gonna be reading your paper, can they connect all the dots, can they understand what you're trying to do? Especially if you think of publishing an interdisciplinary not every single person is going to be an expert in your field, but they will see connections to the work that they do. And the same thing, you know, the sort of the reviewers, um, you know, if you're reviewing somebody's paper, think about, you know, would you like to receive those comments if you were on the other side? You know, provide constructive feedback, be respectful. If you disagree with something, explain why you disagree. Don't just say, you know, don't publish, or publish, nice work, great work, bad work. <laughs> Just explain what, what it is and how the paper, the ultimate goal of the review process is to improve the manuscript and to help the authors to present their work in the best way possible. And so the good papers and the good reviews make the editor's job so much easier. So that's all. I'll, I'll stop here and I can take questions after that. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Glenn. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, I'm a project scientist with a joint appointment between um, the Mesoscale and Microscale Meteorology Lab and, and the Computational Information Sciences Lab. Um, so I've been here about uh, almost 11 years now. So um, the, my, I guess, reviewer editorial experience, I, I've uh, written papers and I've reviewed for a lot of different journals, um, mostly as for a monthly weather review and weather and forecasting within AMS. Um, I've been an associate editor there for, I guess, eight years for a monthly weather review and five years with weather and forecasting. And then I just started as a regular editor for a monthly weather review. Uh, so now I get, get to see the other side of the animal. Um, so it, uh, it's been an interesting uh, journey, I guess, in, in reviewing. But yeah, I, I think um, I, there's already been some great points made by, by Scott and Olia. So I'll, I'll just um, 
add to it that probably the, the failure mode that I run into the most with, with papers is oftentimes I think when you do science, you come in with this idea of what you would like to, to write a paper about, but sometimes your results don't support that idea anymore. <laughs> and people have a hard time letting go and recognizing what they can actually say from the results that they have to work with. And, and oftentimes they try to just shoehorn it in and you start off reading the paper and you think it's gonna be about one thing and then you get to the results and they have nothing to do with, with the original topic or at least what they can support is not there. And, and that often causes a lot of problems because one, either it's the, the reviewer coming in thinking, you know, the paper's about one thing and what you're showing is something completely different and now they may get confused or, or they're going to come in and say, well, you know, you don't have supporting results for the statements you're trying to make. Those are, those are bad things in the review process. Um, and then the other thing that could happen is sometimes you end up destroying the framing um, coming in because you don't really, like, you just have a bunch of results and you're kind of throwing them out there and maybe just seeing, you know, maybe the reviewers will provide you with some structure. And they may interpret it in completely different ways. And then all of a sudden, you know, they may think that you're trying to say something that you're not. And then they'll often say, well, you don't have any results to support this. Well, I wasn't trying to say that, you know, because you didn't lead them down the path. So you really have to kind of structure it so that they know exactly what you're trying to argue and defend. And so the structure is probably the most important way to make sure that they stay on target and on path. Um, and then usually the other things that will that come up it just end up kind of being nitpicky stuff. Um, that will get you lots of revisions, perhaps, but those are manageable. Um, but the things that get you rejected usually are just unsupported results or, you know, confusion about what it is you're trying to present, <coughs> or there's just not enough there. Um, that's the other thing that usually will get you a rejection is that you just, you know, if you, it's not enough material for that journal. So it's, it's important to recognize when you come in and you want to submit to a particular journal what the expectations are for how much content should be there. Because um, different journals have very different expectations of what they expect the paper to be, how much material, how many points you're trying to make. Some, you can make one point and it's totally fine. Others expect a fairly complete uh, assessment and story. And so you just kind of have to have a good sense of that before you go in and submit to that. So that you kind of know what reviewers are used to seeing. Um, Within each journal, there's uh, what are known as associate editors. Um, and when you're an editor, you're almost always going to try to have at least one associate editor come in. And so that's like a super reviewer, someone who's probably reviewing 20 to 30 papers a year at least. And so they have an expectation coming in when they get this paper of what they're expecting to see in terms of content, quality, uh, things of that nature. And if you don't meet that sort of typical standard for that journal, they're going to be the first ones that poo-poo you, and when an associate editor says that your paper is no good, you're pretty much sunk in the review process because the editor is going to put a lot of weight on that review. And I'll stop there. Can you just clarify the structure of an editor, associate editor, how that kind of all works in the review process? Uh, I can define it for, for within AMS. I don't know in other journals necessarily okay. how it works. But within AMS, so there's usually, uh, for each journal, there'll be a single chief editor, and they're usually the, the primary person who, every paper that comes in, they do a quick check to see if it sort of meets rough standards of what the journal would expect, um, and they could potentially just reject it right away if there's problems uh, that, that they see immediately. Um, otherwise, then they'll assign it to an editor, and, and you would, hope as the editor that the paper get, that gets assigned to you is one that you know something about, but there's no guarantee of that because it depends on what the loads are of other editors, and so you may get a paper that you don't actually know very well, but you still have to handle it. And then uh, underneath each editor, they can, at the beginning of each year, they can pick a team of people that they want to have help them in review processes, so usually you can pick two to three associate editors, for instance, within monthly weather review. So I get to go through and basically say, I'd really like to have you know X, Y, and Z people as my associate editors. Um, so you can pick people that are in sort of your area that you want to have available to you that you can lean on to do papers. So when you're 
asked to be an associate editor, there's sort of this expectation that if your primary editor who invited you asks you to review a paper, that you'll more often than not say yes. Um, and so within Monthly Weather View, they, they handle a lot of papers, so they have a lot of associate editors um, that are on the team. But generally speaking, as an editor, when you go to pick reviewers, you almost always want to have at least one associate editor that is going to look at the paper, because it's someone whose reviews you have a track record of that you can trust. So all reviewers get rated, like it or not. Um, when, when you go through the edit, editor process, you get to assign how good you thought the review was that you got from each of the reviewers. And that uh, scoring gets saved, and it's distributed as a spreadsheet <laughs> to all the editors. And so when I'm picking my associate editors, I get to go through and look at the spreadsheet, and you know, I can say, hey, Jared, uh, I see you know, Jared has a score of you know, whatever. You know, and it's like, oh, you know, he, he said no <laughs> to, to 20 of the papers that he was invited to review last year. Uh, and so, and, and he tends to be five days late on getting his review back. Like, I don't know if I want to pick Jared to be my associate editor. I'm just picking on Jared because he's sitting in the back because <laughs> he doesn't want to offer comments, I guess. Uh, so that, that's the kind of uh, scenario you have in terms of setting it up and, and picking reviewers. Is this, there, there's some metadata that exists to help you make that choice. And so if I pick someone that historically has a good track record of reviewing and they don't like your paper, you're probably in trouble. So along the lines, um, we have a question from online. And the question is, kind of in your own personal careers, would you recommend becoming either an editor or an associate editor and how has this impacted your career, maybe for better or worse? Um, maybe, Olya, we could start with you. Yeah. I think it's a really great experience. Um, so I have not been an associate editor, but I have been an editor, what you know, Glenn has described. And I think it's really valuable to see kind of the other side of the peer review, peer review process, um, because you not only really start learning what makes a good paper versus not such a good paper, but it also gives you appreciation for good reviewers and not very helpful reviewers too. And then also help you to become a better reviewer in the process as well. Um, finding reviewers can be really challenging, especially you know, because all of these you know, editors, associate editors, reviewers, it's all volunteer jobs essentially. And so when, when you ask to you know, do this, so that's just an extra load to whatever else you're doing. And so, and I think that's where you really start kind of seeing and appreciating, you know, things that people put, you know, careful consideration, a lot of thought, you know, they're prompt on time, they accept a decline your invitation in a timely matter, um, because the review process can get really long if, it, if you can't find reviewers, and you know, it just, you know, it, it just prolongs the review process. And I also want to just say, you know, kind of to it, but. <clears throat> Glenn was saying, at least with the uh, Better Climate and Society Journal, the way I used associate editors often is sometimes if I had uh, conflicting reviews, you know, somebody loved the paper, somebody hated the paper, and I'm not an expert matter in this, you know, kind of particular publication, so that's when I also can rely on associate editors who might have expertise in this. So they would be almost um, kind of like a referee yeah. <laughs> in a way, you know, so if it helps me you know, to figure out, you know, how to, you know, proceed with decisions. So, but yeah, I think it's definitely a valuable process, help, help you a lot. Just one quick follow-up question on that. So when you reach out to an associate editor to essentially be a tiebreaker, do they know that they're a tiebreaker in that instance? Usually, yes. So um, I don't share reviews with them of others, but I just say, you know, I have this paper, you know, looks like reviewers disagree on how to proceed, and I would like your input on that. I've actually had it the other way too, where I was shared the, the review that was in question, mm -hmm. and more or less asked to review the review, is this, is this correct? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's difficult, so when you're reviewing, you know, I think what Olya said, be respectful and do a thorough job because this is a small field and the editors are prominent people. And, and you're, it's also a part of your own reputation, uh, like it or not. 
Can you give an insight on, um, sometimes it happens, you submit a paper and then you get uh, major revisions back, but from the reviews it was one rejected, one minor, and then the editor decides on like major revisions for that, and that's just kind of very, they're kind of like, well, what do I do now? Because I can't, like, can't, this is, like, it's just a weird limbo, and I wonder in which situations that happens, or like, what? yeah. <laughs> it does happen frequently. Um, the, the, the editor that I work with um, and the papers that I've seen with that, the, the editor usually gives you some comments and should be able to say, you know, that there were some helpful comments. Why, you know, but in particular, these things okay. seem to be a weakness of the, the study. And so then the editor is giving you a clue as to what they feel is important. Okay. If they don't, I'm not sure uh, if if you, you know, when would be the right time to, to approach the editor and say because I've I've had a colleague okay. who jumped through hoops to do all these crazy things that the reviewer was asking for, and the editor didn't think they were necessary, and at the end said, "Why didn't you just talk to me?" So um, I think it, it varies with editor, but so usually there's there's some information there that you can take. If there's if there's not, then it might be worth asking the editor. Yeah, and yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, since you have mentioned that finding good reviewers are so difficult, um, some of my past co-authors suggest me that every time I submit a paper, I have to suggest some reviewers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was wondering how, how important do you think is that to do, and what are the good strategy? What are the good suggestions for reviewers? Like how to avoid obvious conflict of interest and maybe, um, yeah, <laughs> just to show that editor can see that you respect the process. I think it's definitely helpful to provide suggested reviewers. Um, so at least with a mass journal, we have a reviewer database at our kind of expo exposal to peak reviewers. But what I find that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't because maybe the database is not, hasn't been updated. Um, you know, maybe some area, of broad area of expertise is listed, but the person may not be familiar with a specific method and approach that the paper is addressing. So sometimes, you know, we start with this database to look for reviewers, and sometimes, most of the time, we just go and, you know, sort of think of people who might provide a really good review. You know, somebody who is knowledgeable about the topic, about the method, about the you know, sort of data that, you know, being described. And you know, oftentimes, you know, like if I, if I, you know, if I, if I run out of options, I look at what people cite, you know, in their paper, mm -hmm. and saying, okay, if they're citing the other somebody else who's working in the field, then I approach those people. Sometimes it's just like a Google Scholar search and see who else is working in the subject. Um, so, I think in terms of conflict of interest, I think that's an interesting point because again, it's such a small field, and most people know others who, you know, have, you know, they have colleagues who publish, or unless it's something really, really obvious, like if you have personal issues with the author, and then you have to be really upfront with the editor or saying, I know I will not be able to review this objectively. So then, you know, it, that, in that case, you know, the editor will respect that. But if, you know, I can say, well, you know, I worked with this person before, but I feel like I can still do an objective review, then that's totally fine. So because otherwise, if you start eliminating everybody you work with as a published list, then there will be no reviewers left. <laughs> yeah, I like the idea of having um, some suggestions. I think it's, it's useful. They may or may not get used, but I think it's, it's helpful to give them some idea of who you think knows um, about your topic area. So, um, so I, I would recommend at least including a couple. Um, they may or may not get used, so just uh, I guess don't have expectations. If it's in a field that it, that I would know something about, then I, I might know like, okay, that person's in this camp. They, I know they have a tendency to self-cite a lot. Um, I'm going to cross-pollinate them with this other group. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that may be a purposeful thing, and, and that's probably the hated reviewer that you get uh, that comes back and, and wants lots of changes because they're from the other camp and, and they may not like it. But I, I think that sort of cross-pollination is 
important and necessary, and as an editor, it would definitely be something that I would try to do if, if I see a problem with that. So when, at what point in your career would you recommend uh, people consider stepping, or volunteering to be, say, an associate editor? I, and you should have a few publications <laughs> <laughs> yourself. I, I think that's a good starting point. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think, it, you know, there's always a desperation to have good reviewers, and so express interest, uh, and then spend a lot of time on that first review uh, so that you get the attention of the editor and say, wow, that was a really good review. I'm gonna ask you again. And, and then once you've proven yourself to be valuable for that person who handles papers in your area, uh, then they're likely to wanna add you as an associate editor in their next round. Kind of related to Jared's question, would you caution early career, so postdoc, early career scientist, from volunteering just because of the time management um, considerations? Perhaps they have publications already and they do have expertise in an area. I think Olya made a great point about that before, and that, that's just that you, by look, being a reviewer and seeing how other people write papers and what is a good paper and a bad paper, you yourself are going to be a lot better at writing papers. And um, certainly, my first few papers were terrible. <laughs> so, uh, becoming a reviewer helped me look at more in a, in a much more critical eye than just reviewing them to find content. So, I think uh, you'll get a lot of experience from being a reviewer. And so, if, if writing still seems mysterious to you, then do it. If you're if you just got it nailed. Um, yeah, it's probably not your most efficient use of time. That'd be my opinion. Yeah, no, I would definitely recommend being a reviewer, but maybe waiting a little bit to become like an associate editor because that would be a really large volume of reviews. Mm -hmm. One other thing to consider too is uh, be a reviewer for proposals, but uh, be on a proposal committee or an ad hoc proposal reviewer because you really see what makes a good proposal. Don't limit yourself to just publications. For those who maybe have interest in reviewing proposals or papers, how do you go about, do you email an editor and say, hey, if, can I review papers, or how does that work? I've, I've never had to <laughs> advertise that I need to be sent to review. Uh, I think when you, when you publish a paper and, and uh, you get you know, your name out there and get some references, to, you'll show up, but if you're not getting any, then, and you would like to, then I would encourage you to, yeah, and to ask. Exactly. Another, another way to, to do that, let's say if you have a colleague who is maybe more senior, you can express your interest in reviewing mm -hmm. papers. And so let's say, you know, if I get a request to review a paper and I'm really busy, then I could send email back to the editor and say, you know, right now I have too many commitments, but I think Ken's going to be a great and that's another thing is that um, it's really important not to delegate reviews because I think that's something people think sometimes think like, well, I can't review it, but I'm going to ask my you know whatever colleague to review it, and then I'm going to submit it. Never do that <laughs> so, because you are being asked to review a paper because the editor perceives you as an expert in the field. And with that review is going to be associated with you. <laughs> and so if you can't review your paper, just suggest it to other reviewers. And that's actually another really important question. If you decline, and, and sometimes you will decline reviews, it's really helpful to suggest alternate reviewers. Because that also would. And provide their email address if you can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that would make editors job easier. Yeah. yeah. Jenny's really good. <laughs> but then for a proposal reviewing process, do you have to have submitted proposals before to be considered as a reviewer? Or yeah, how? Okay. pretty much. Okay. So I'm not usually sure. you have to be, so when, once you're funded by an agency, then you're in their pool. I see. Yeah. And then yeah. they'll hit you hard <laughs> with okay. requests. But they, I think it's it would be unlikely to get asked to do a lot. Sometimes here as an NCAR employee, you get asked to, re to review NSF proposals, 
just as a generic um, NSF fish expert, but even if you don't have an NSF proposal, I've seen that happen. So, to that question, Sally, I'll just share a personal experience. I emailed a program officer and expressed my interest in reviewing proposals and actually was asked to serve on one um, not long after that. So that, for those interested, could be an option too. It's probably, it's certainly not the most common way, um, but it could be out there. Mm -hmm. So the downside, I'll point out, sorry, um, okay. uh, the downside to doing the ad hoc reviews for like NSF and stuff is that you'll submit your review, but you'll never see anyone else's. Yeah. Um, and so I think what's helpful also is to see how other people will view the same thing. And yeah. that's mm -hmm. the part that is harder to see unless you get involved in, say, panels. Yeah. So when you go to do panel reviews, those are super valuable because yeah. you're going to go and see how everybody else sees the same Thing that you're trying to look at and you'll get a lot more information about what resonates and does not resonate with, with reviewers. Sorry, you had a question? Um, yeah, I just so, I guess I was wondering what's going on there. So I um, I submitted my first paper during my master's and then I got hit with a bunch of like requests to review other papers and I was of course very overwhelmed. I had no idea how to do that and like what to even accept and what's even, what's even, yeah. And um, so I declined a bunch and probably not in the like most thoughtful way because I didn't know back then. And so now I haven't like <laughs> received requests in a really long time. And I would like to actually change it again because I think now I'm at a point where I think I can actually give a good review rather than just a like early grad student kind of level review where you're like, eh, um, <laughs> about most things. So, um, so now at that would be a good like uh, step right now to take to actually approach a paper and be like, okay, I've learned a bunch and now I would be like happy to review. <laughs> um, is that how I approach that? Is it the same editor for the ones when they asked you before, or were they oh, well, I've no all idea. over the place? I think yeah. they were from various journals. Yeah, I mean you could reach out to the editor again to say, oh, I wasn't available then, but I am available yeah. now in case you come up with a paper that. Mm -hmm. in line, but. And the more you publish, the more yeah. requests you will get. And you can talk to some of your people, senior people you work with. That was a great point, Amelia, that they can direct some reviews you okay. I mean, the editor always makes the choice, but yeah. I think if uh, Olya says you're going to be a good reviewer, it's likely you'll see that in her inbox. So I want to circle back to a content question that I think Scott and Glenn, you hit on earlier. And it's this question of when do you have enough and going for this, you know, one significant impact paper versus splitting it into three. And so um, to all three of you, do you have any thoughts or guidance on that content versus, as you put it, you know, least publishable unit? That's a tough one uh, because it varies a lot uh, from one person to another, from one study to another, and from one topic to another. But I, I think you, you know, my advice is to, to develop your own sense of, of what story do you want to tell with this publication and this study um, and what impact. I mean, not every publication you need to do, you're going to do is going to be the impact of Man and Julian. But that's a, that was a bit of an extreme example. But, you know, can I get three lightweight? papers out of this, can I kind of cram them through, or, or do I do a little bit bigger paper and, and maybe it has a, a, a little bit more of a complete story to tell? And, and it's really a judgment call. Um, and, and my advice was not to you know, say anything specific, but just to, to focus on the science and, and the problem at hand. And does your publication address that in, in some reasonable way? Um, even if you could you know, do something quicker. Um, maybe this is more what you're interested in and, and might have a bigger impact. Even if it's not a man, Julia. 19, whatever it was. <coughs> Does that help at all? I don't think yeah, it did. I would like to hear other thoughts. Yeah, and, and I think that some of it also depends on the journals because a lot of journals have specific word counts. And so mm -hmm. if you think that a particular journal has the audience that you're trying to reach, and you could see about like what types of papers they they publish. For example, some journals may be really uh, appropriate to publish a method, 
So you might want to publish a method in one journal, and then maybe you write another paper where you cite that method and talk about the, the framing and the results and the findings from, from your study. Because I think the danger of, I mean, I agree that, you know, it needs to be a complete story and not like have sort of like artificial, you know, breaks. But sometimes the danger is where people also try to make papers really, really dense. And there's so much in them. Yeah, and, you need to have a focus point. Right. right. And so story. like the method is really complex and then there's, you know, modeling experiments and mm -hmm. results and theory that's part of it. And so then sometimes that can detract from the story if you mm -hmm. say very little about each piece of your research. So in that case, I think it might make more sense to actually have a separate Absolutely. papers where you go a little bit in depth about methodology and more in depth about the results and how those connected. So, but I would say it really depends on case by case basis on the journals. Because some of the journals accept long papers, you know, more than 10,000 words, but other journals want something really succinct. Mm -hmm. And then you might be better off to sort of like, yeah. here's a point, <laughs> and yeah. that's what you need to know. Right. It's an interesting balance. Yeah, it's a balance, yeah. yeah. And I like the idea of kind of partitioning it out to where you maybe would do different parts of it. I, I think what, what's less popular is, you know, part one, part two, part three papers. <laughs> um, it, reviewers hate those because right? <laughs> they get sent all three parts <laughs> and they have 90 days to do the review on them. And it's, it's an incredible workload that is very difficult to find anyone to volunteer for. Um, and, and often it's just not necessary. Um, it, so I, I think it's a, it, it requires effort, but yeah, I mean, you could always ask for help in terms of how to partition it and break it apart if you have just too much content. Um, but I think oftentimes the, there really is some sort of key stories in there and, and then some peripheral stories. And sometimes you just have to sacrifice the peripheral stories as not being the big thing and, and let them go. I definitely don't want to see um, you know, every experiment that you've ran where there's 15 lines that are all laying on top of each other with no meaningful difference about them. None of them tell an interesting story, but you ran the simulation and you want to show me. Like, I don't want to see that. <laughs> so show me the pieces that are interesting and different mm -hmm. and, and focus on, on where the, the biggest story is and kind of let the rest of it go away. Um, so that, that part I, I, I think is sustainable and don't build an acronym that's got 50,000 characters in it that no one can remember what it is um, because you've got so many experiments that you need this ginormous acronym. That, that's also a, a real difficulty. The sort of bare minimum to get it in is I guess the other side of it. It's like, when is it enough? And honestly, I don't think that there's a clear answer to that because it depends on how good you are at crafting. Um, I've seen people that have basically no real results, but they write a very elegant story about this tiny bit of results that they have, and it still gets published. So it kind of depends on who you are and what you can get away with, I guess. But some people seem to get away with almost nothing, and it still gets published. So I don't think there's a, a bare minimum that is an obvious requirement of what it takes to get through. So, sorry, question? Yeah, um, this is kind of building on the question of what Olia said about the danger is making papers really dense. And I was wondering, I mean, many of us, I think, are in the stage of our postdoc where we're really becoming independent and we're really leading our own papers without mentors weighing in on every sentence. And so do you have any advice for, you know, checking that? Because the whole story is in your head, right? It's just a question of whether it's on the paper. Um, do you have any thoughts about how to make um, make sure the whole story is there and and you're not just your you know sentences aren't just so dense and for me it goes back to what I think both of them have said it, you know when you have the experience of being a reviewer you can take a look at your paper and try to put on that reviewer hat again and, and see, then you really you can start to see, and it's really hard, and, yeah, you know, we still fail at this sometimes, but you see the, the holes in, in the story that you're telling. Um, and so really keeping in mind the reviewer as you're writing it, and how is it organized, and is there a block of text with 16 different points and no subheaders that, that you know, 
that's another thing that my, my PhD advisor told me is nobody's going to read your paper from the start to the finish except for the reviewers. Everybody's going to go and try to look and find what you've got. So if you've got these huge blocks of text and things are hidden in there, it's not going to be very easy to use. So you know, just I think keeping in mind the you know because we all read papers, you know, the, but the vantage point of the reader and the reviewer um, while you're writing it, and and almost most more importantly, or at least as importantly, while you're organizing it, uh, seems like a really good strategy. And of course. You know, when I get the internal reviews back or whatever, something I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I failed to do that. But so you know, so you try to do it as, as best you can. So, so one way to maybe make the paper itself a little bit less dense, you know, is the use of supplemental materials and appendices. So some journals allow for that, and so the paper needs to tell a story, right? So it's kind of like what what is and, and have something new to say, and if you feel like you have more to add to the story, but it may not be sort of like your main characters in the story, then they can go into supplemental material. And so if somebody might just want to read your paper and they can be satisfied with that, but somebody who might want a little bit more detail about the method or maybe seeing some additional you know, experiments, then they can refer to supplemental material. But I don't know if all journals allow that or not, but I know some MS journals usually. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can put an appendix. Appendix, yeah. Yeah, not, not, but, but again, only if it's necessary. Not just like I have the, all this extra, I'm going to put it in <laughs> supplemental material, but if you feel like it, it really adds, but maybe not the main focus, then make use of that. Use simple language. Yeah. Don't try to get out the thesaurus and figure out the fanciest word that you can possibly use or the most colorful word, because it just invites problems. Mm -hmm. so, blossoming and Exploding, uh, you know, it just it, it gets people down the wrong track of what you're trying to say. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and I'll, I'll throw one other thing. Also, if if, um, if you're just not very good at writing, feel free to ask for help from somebody who you think is better at writing for for grammar and things like that. Um, it's okay if, if you're just not an expert and you need some help. Uh, don't hesitate to ask peers for for help with with grammar to try to make it easier to read. Uh, it's a real obstacle for a reviewer if they're having a hard time understanding what it is that you're trying to say. Um, if English isn't your first language, then you know there's professional services if you don't want to ask a friend. Um, but, but if you put it in and there's problems along those regards, it, it almost always makes your review process a lot more painful because the person gets hung up on all the grammatical things along the way and the language. Using words as they mean, not you know, yeah. Because if you're not sure the things. meaning is like, well, it sounds more colorful. I'm gonna throw it in, and it could mean something completely different when the other person raises. Like, I don't think you really want to say that, and, and then it just yeah, you'll just end up with the 15-page um, review. I have a follow-up question on that. So, as a reviewer, am I technically responsible for correcting language or not? Because then there's also typesetting in the end, right? So that should really take care of everything my, my approach is if, if it's if it's pretty lightweight yeah. I'll, I'll put the corrections in yeah. you know comment number 12 you know add the period or whatever mm -hmm. um, if it's if it's too much then it's too much and I'll make it a major comment the, the grammar is not you know the English writing is not okay and okay. that needs to be fixed throughout but I will not go through and fix mm -hmm. 100 different grammatical Problems that I see. So I think I did that. I actually once. tried to do that once because it was a friend's paper. Okay. <laughs> I vowed never to do that again. <laughs> like 50 to 7 comments or something. So, so. I think that happened in one of when I was a reviewer that I then made a major comment that the language needs to improve. And mm -hmm. then in the next revision, it wasn't really improved. And then do you just give that same? comment again until yeah. they do something yes. about it? Or yeah. I, yes. I really didn't know my role there either as a reviewer. Well, you, it is part of your role to point out if it's just unacceptably bad to the point that it's a, a hindrance to reading the paper. Okay. Um, it, it may be you may think it's obvious, but but I think you should say it um, okay. and call it out. And, and in some ways, that's actually supposed to be checked before it gets to you, but oftentimes it's it's not. Um, 
that it's okay to, to call it out, and it's a reason for rejection if someone just doesn't fix it. Okay. I'd say on, on that note, AMS journals do tend to have a higher quality of writing and proof and proofreading, it does appear, whereas there are several other journals where it, it doesn't look like the, either the typesetting editor or anyone at the journal even read the thing. Because <laughs> uh, there's so many typos they get through in the final published product. And so at least for me, when I review, yeah, I'm catching everything. But if, if it's like, I'm generally happy with the paper, but there are a few things like I'll, you know, I might list out, you know, the little detail things because I want it to be a good paper. But if it's, yeah, if it's a huge thing, I'm going to reject it, then I might just give, maybe, I might give examples mm -hmm. of, here are some of the types of things that I see. Here's one example. There are more in the rest of the paper. Because I think it, I think it's, at least I think it would be helpful uh, if I got a paper back and someone said, you know, oh, the English needs to be fixed. I would, I would at least want to have some clue of what to look for. So I try to put myself in the shoes of I want to, I want to do, I do want to help the author here, the author team. So I want to at least give them some pointers of where to go, of what to look for to fix. All right. So I mean, if the journal has high standards like that, then I think in some ways that it is the responsibility between the reviewers and the editors to, and eventually the typesetter, to make sure that it meets that standard. Um, I don't. I don't know what happens if it goes through that. You don't often see it, obviously, as you mentioned, where it makes it through the entire process and these things haven't been addressed at some level. So whose responsibility is it? Well, I don't think it's particularly well um, defined. But I'll do the same. I usually, I'm, I'll do a lot of those um, edits of grammar, even, even though I don't think it's necessarily my job as the reviewer. You're, you're technically hired to provide scientific expertise. So as the editor, do you read through the entire paper before you assign it to a reviewer? So oh, no. No, okay. I just <laughs> <laughs> Does the editor even know in which state this paper is? So that I, like, if it already came to me past the editor, does that mean he already kind of okayed the language? And, or? I, I had a few papers. So I don't maybe read it word, word to word, but I do scan it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and I, like, for example, for weather, climate, and society, you know, there have been a couple of, like, you know, the three years I've been an editor, I think there maybe been two papers where I had to write back to the chief editor and say, I don't think that belongs in this journal um, because it has no social science or it doesn't have any human dimensions. It's basically a whole bunch of mythological, you know, exper experiments that somebody claims is good for society. So that doesn't belong. So it's like, let's just transfer it to a you know, monthly weather review. And then the editor from monthly weather review says, no, it doesn't, you know, <laughs> too, because science is not deep enough, right? So then you kind of get into this, like, what are we going to do with this paper? And sometimes it's a rejection at that point. So, but I think sometimes if it's like within the AMS, sometimes the editors from different journals might talk to each other and say, would you take that paper or would you, you know, so yeah, so you look at the papers. And another thing that you could do as an editor, and I think some journals are more, um, have that practice more than others. So if I see the paper, it, it meets the general guidelines of the journal, and I read it, like I scan it, and I just think it's a horrible paper. I can, you know, I have two options. I can send it to a review, but then each of my reviewers probably are going to be mad at me for sending them a really bad paper instead of me rejecting it outright. So, so I think, some journals, you know, the editor can also just, you know, look at a paper and say, there's fatal flaws, you know, there's no merit, you know, reject. So instead of getting, you know, waiting three months and having three reviewers say, reject, 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 and then these reviewers might not review for you in the future because you sent them really bad paper. Okay. So I think in a lot, a lot, probably most cases, you know, suggestions from reviewers or co-authors um, that are maybe grammatical or something like this are a sign of like an, another problem and then making that comment can help you think about how to reframe your paper or something like this. But what happens when maybe it's just a suggestion from a co-author or 
a reviewer, do you have um, kind of a way of dealing with it where it's, pu it's purely stylistic? Like, do you have a way of saying, no, I don't want to change my paper to be passive throughout the entire thing, or something like this, doing, doing so in a polite way. I've always kind of struggled with, okay, but this is how I write, so. Um. Yeah, I mean, just because someone asks you to do it or tells you you should do it, uh, you can decline. And then it, you know, the reviewer may feel very strongly about it or they may just be like, well, it's just a suggestion, I don't really care. Um, if they feel really, really strongly about it and they complain again, then it falls on the editor to decide, uh, you know, who wins. Um, some editors are, are very afraid of pissing off their reviewers and don't want to go against them. And so they'll tend to, to go along with, you know, keep my reviewers happy because otherwise they're not going to review for me next time if I go against them. Um, but, but others are happy to just step in and say, well, you know, I'm calling a truce. Uh, this person wins and they'll go down that route. And so that, that is ultimately what their editor is supposed to do. Same thing if you get like rejection to minor revisions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the editor's job to figure out like, okay, is the, is this rejection overly cruel? Um, is, is the, you know, except with minor revisions, like they didn't actually understand it, um, didn't know enough about the topic, or maybe they had some relationship with the person and so they just couldn't review it uh, critically. It, that's the role of the editor to figure that stuff out. So I want to follow up though on Olivia's question because there's kind of the stylistic things, but then there's also the science piece. And while facts are facts, one question I'm curious is what happens when you have a reviewer or editor? Perhaps there's a clarity issue and maybe you can address there, but what if there is truly just a disagreement in kind of the, you know, the analysis that was run, the conclusions that are made? How should an author kind of navigate that level of a disagreement? And maybe related, what are you looking for in an author's kind of response to reviewers where they do want to make a, a rebuttal and kind of justify their position? Maybe Scott or Oli? <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, the first step is what Olya said, you know, try to not take it personally um, and try to, you know, as, when I get reviews back, I usually read them and then I put them aside and then I come back to them, you know, and when I finish a review, I never send it off right away. I, I, I sleep on it and I reread the whole thing and usually end up softening the language or trying to be more helpful in the language. Um, that being said, I think if you really have a disagreement in the analysis and you can justify your position, you should be able to justify your position, then I would say do that in, in a respectful way. Um, even if the reviewer hasn't been respectful, you know, you know this is this is a good point. You know, they, they, this is what they believe, and, and as a reviewer, realize too that the authors have worked very hard and try to be respectful and say, okay, I, I think what you did is is whatever, and, and but but what about these other things? So um, yeah, and if, if you if you really feel like you're justified and you can, you know, usually when you get a harsh comment, it, it does make you reevaluate the. You know, are they right? Do, do they have a point? And if they don't have a point, then you you have a justification for your work, and you can say, "I'm not going to make that change because of this, this, and this." And, and you give the reasoning in very clear language in your response. Um, and then, like Glenn said, it's up to the editor. If the editor agrees with the reviewer, then maybe you have to make that change or or resubmit it. Somewhere else or, that's also a great time to call for help uh, from the associate editor too. So that's when you know you could use the extra mm -hmm. opinion, uh, or even invite another reviewer. Like mm -hmm. if, if you don't know the, the subject yourself, but that's as an editor. As an editor. But one thing I also should note that um, even if your paper gets rejected, you can still appeal. Mm -hmm. So you can write to the editor, and if you completely disagree, you know, I mean, if 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 it's not just sort of like taking a stand and saying this is the best science ever. But if you think there were some comments that you feel like maybe reviewers didn't quite understand your approach, or they feel like they didn't provide enough justification for why the paper is rejected, um, you can appeal. 
can say you can provide, but as you as you appeal, you also have to provide justification why you appeal on the process. So I've seen that happening a couple of times, and sometimes the editor and chief, and at that point the chief editor has to weigh in as well. Um, but I've seen it a couple of times when the paper was finally you know revised, but they, everybody has to say. You know, if you want this paper to be published, you have to address reviewers' comments <coughs> or submit some results. And another thing I was going to mention, um, I had that happen to me once. So if your paper gets rejected from one journal, it usually the reviewers still have to provide the comments how to improve the manuscript. And I would highly recommend before submitting it to another journal, addressing the reviewers' comments. So one time I had a paper that was submitted to Weather Climate and Society, and it was usually if the paper was rejected by another journal from AMS, then the review process gets, you know, open, you know, we know what happened there. But if it's from another journal, sometimes, you know, we don't know. Um, so I sent the paper for review, and I got a response from reviewers saying, I already reviewed this paper for another journal. And none of my comments I still addressed. Wow. So you already, you know, again, because it's such a small world. Mm -hmm. And so then we go again through the agony of mm -hmm. you know, sending the author. You know, so the viewer basically said, here's my additional comments from another journal. <laughs> Take it or leave it. And, and so that was a very uncomfortable <laughs> situation. <laughs> so, so definitely you know, consider, because again, you might get the same reviewer, even if it's another journal. When, when um, a person, say at, at a postdoctoral level, has um, feedback from a journal and they don't, let's say it's negative or more negative than they want, and they, they need uh, support in figuring out what to do. So that's, I think, in my, my own experience, I didn't ask for enough help mm -hmm. from people. You know, what do I do? What can I do? And then it got dropped, or I, you know, I didn't publish it, have not. And how, who, who do you have ideas of who can people go to, scientists, young scientists go to, for advice? I mean, who do you suggest? Like, you know, it could be, I guess, a wide variety of ideas if you have them, but just to help fertilize the imagination. Do you have co-authors? Author should <laughs> pitch in, um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, you, you, you go to your peer network. In some ways, I mean, you are the expert. You wrote this paper. You generated the science. You should be able to respond to the questions, um, and they may not be to the satisfaction of the reviewer, but you know, it is what it is. So I would say stand your ground and de defend yourself if you don't. If you don't want to do it, or you don't think it's the right change to make, uh, defend it. You know, argue for your position. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, and I, I've seen lots of people that get reviews, and maybe they only do, you know, half of what they're asked to do because someone's like, "Well, I'm not running more experiments. I'm not, you know, I can't go back and, and recreate X, Y, and Z." Um, you, you you just say, "Well, you know, that's a great idea, but it's beyond the scope." or it's, uh, uh, I don't have time or, you know, computational time to be able to redo experiments, whatever, just say, well, you know, I can't do that and defend why and then just see what happens. I mean, they may come back and say, oh, no, you really got to do it. Uh, and then you go through another round. But for that first round, for sure, uh, just stand your ground if you really think that what they're telling you isn't going to make your paper better. Because that's what these comments are supposed to be. They're supposed to take your science and make it more valuable to the community. And if what they're offering you isn't going to make that science better, uh, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Don't just do it because they think you should. Um, there should be a reason. If they haven't justified why you should do it, you should justify why you shouldn't do it. <laughs> In the recent experience, I, had, I wrote a paper and it was an observation, so I wasn't running models you know, with the computer time, but it was a technique and, and the author thought if I did this, it would it would make it better. And I immediately thought, well, I don't think so, but I know I can try it. 
I have some demonstration code. And so I tried it and it, it didn't really pan out. And so that was very powerful. That was like his major revision. And, and I said, well, that's a great idea, but I, I tried it out and it turns out for these and these reasons, it either doesn't make any difference or it, it doesn't really help. Um, and, and, that, and that went through. So, you know, in that way, I really, I was fortunate because I really had a strong justification. I tried it and it didn't work. Okay. But so I think if you come up with a justification um, and it's pretty strong, uh, like Glenn said, you're the, you're the expert, you should have pretty good luck most of the time. Another, I was just going to add to that. So sometimes also if you unable to you know, collect more data or do more modeling experiments that you suggest, sometimes they are asking for that because your conclusions the evidence that you provide and the conclusions that you draw from the evidence don't match. And so what you may have to do in that case is to rethink a little bit how you're presenting your results. So for example, if you ran some limited number of experiments and you're drawing this really general, you know, general conclusions, then the reviewer might say, okay, prove it. Right? So then you might, you know, sort of reframe your paper and make it a little bit more uh, focused. And instead of sort of, you know, making these big, big statements without sort of supporting evidence. And you could say, you know, this is what this paper is about, and I'm confident in these results, and this is what they tell me, instead of kind of like being this really big and broad without sort of system, the substantiated evidence. So, so there's a number of things. That's the most common yeah. reason that I've seen for rejection or, or even major revisions is the, the conclusions are too grandiose mm -hmm. uh, for the limited data that are used. Can I ask a follow question about the additional experiment? Where do you put the new results? If it's negative or doesn't support your conclusion, do you put it into the main manuscript or you put it in supporting information or just put it in the response to reviewer? Yeah, response to reviewers is, yeah, that's the right place for it. So if you don't want it in your paper, but you want to demonstrate uh, that you did consider uh, what the reviewer asked you to look at, that's the place to put it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, it, going along with what Scott said, definitely if, if you have the data and it's trivial to, to demonstrate something that someone thinks is a great idea, um, go ahead and, and provide it with them. And it, you know, who knows, they may have a great idea that really yeah. does make your paper better. And you'll be like, oh, and I liked it, and now it's figure 14. Yeah. Um, Great. Really trivial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's always, I mean, you usually have like 60 days to respond to, re to reviews. Yeah. Uh, and, and so you, you generally have time to, to think about it and, and, you know, assume that what they gave you was probably positive, and it may seem like it's just negative and they're being a jerk. You know, maybe they're working in the same field and they're trying to get their paper out before your paper gets out. They may have bad <laughs> intentions and in why they're trying to delay your results from, from being published. Um, but I, I think that's hopefully in the <laughs> rare uh, in occurrence. But yeah, you can get, get just a jerk reviewer. Um, and yeah, <laughs> and, and sometimes you just have to, to kind of yeah figure out how to deal with that um, and, and hope that the editor will jump in um, if, if needed. But there's one experience I had where there was a pretty major, it was a different technique that, uh, that we developed, and it was a pretty major revision. And, and it, was, it was kind of along the lines of something that I could have thrown into the future work. And, and I had thought about doing what the reviewer was suggesting. Um, and he was even suggesting it on a, on a technique that was already published. So he was sort of questioning not, not this paper, but the previous paper. And I, I really thought to myself, you know what, he's right he or she, and, and I, I, I paused, and I actually ended up being very late with, with my revisions, and to the point where I, I had to resubmit it. But it, in the end, it really was a much better paper and a much better technique. It was more robust. And I could have just decided, well, I'm, I'm going to throw that into the future work and then do that, but would we have gotten to that or not? I don't know. But So, so I, I sort of backed up and I said, okay, this reviewer is making a really good point, and it's a pretty major effort, but
but I think it's worth doing, and I ended up with a better method. So it's always a, it's always a personal choice, and it may, maybe that's not always possible, but that was my one one of my experiences. So um, you mentioned in the beginning, Scott, how it's kind of obvious as an editor or reviewer if like people keep submitting like the same topic or they haven't really done something major new. It's just like a little bit new. So how do you deal with papers where, or like I was involved in, I think two papers where like we started doing this like fairly novel thing for atmospheric sciences, like a technique that had been used in other uh, in other uh, fields, but not here specifically. And so we started looking into this. And, got kind of a lengthy and unfortunate review process, but eventually we got it out. Um, and now, a year later, we've learned a lot more. And like now there's a new paper, which is still similar, because a lot of the setup is very similar. Mm -hmm. But we have many important small results on the individual like applications that are like different enough that this is important to show. Like, no, this actually changes, because we did that wrong the first time. Or like, so eventually, you have to. So you just justified. Okay. A second publication to me, okay. and so it's not that you you have to publish something completely different every time. So my my colleague was reviewing a paper and did a, a Google search and ended up seeing like the entire mostly the entire paper already published in another journal, and so that's more what I'm talking about. Is there's oh, okay. there's, there's really okay. very very little new. Um, that's not to say you shouldn't build on your previous techniques or or even correct your previous tech, you know, paper. Um, so I think that's a perfectly legitimate science, and that's how we go forward. Um, and and so how much increment is 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 enough is again a kind of difficult question to. to who's, who's heard of Morris Wiseman? <laughs> you, you probably have. So he made a career out of basically running a cloud model with a single sounding. Um, and so I, 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 permutations on a, on an experiment. Uh, if it's a solid experiment uh, exactly. foundation, you, you can make a total career out of it. Absolutely. Uh, so it's a, don't feel limited. Okay. No. How about we go here and then, Jared? Okay. So in your perspective, uh, what are the key points that needs to be keep in mind just before accepting or uh, declining a review process? So you've been you've been requested to yeah, if perform I get, a review, and you're you're wondering whether yeah, if I get a paper to review, so what are the factors I need to be considered before accepting or declining that review, either it may be personal or any other factors. I think the first thing is if, if you're feel you're qualified to yeah. review the, the material. Do, do I do I is it aligned enough that I can provide a, a useful, um, and then. You, you know, as as you go on, it, maybe you're reviewing six other papers at that time, and you're you're really not going to be able to provide a timely one. So I think you know, can I do it subject wise? Can I do it? Can I actually get it done? That's another one, and that's legitimate. I mean, you don't want to just always reject papers, you know, reviews because uh, you, you're busy with other things. But if you're reviewing a proposal and two other papers, that's pretty heavy, or you know, six other papers, or whatever. So you wanted to decide that, and then do I have a conflict of interest? Is it my PhD advisor paper, or is it you know something like that? Um, which doesn't happen very often, but sometimes. Um, anything else? I think? I think it sounds good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, let me just add one thing. So, but like Golia's journal, you know, a lot of papers are multidisciplinary now, and so as a radar meteorologist, I might get a tropical meteorology paper to review because it has this radar analysis part. And I'm not really going to be able to evaluate the, the novelty at an expert level of, of the tropical meteorology or some very detailed thing. And so I know that my role is to, well, can I understand what they're doing? I mean, I, I'm at least smart enough to do that. But, and then really focus on the radar part. And, and I, I usually make that clear in my review. I'm a radar person, and I'm, and, but, and so, you know, I'm sort of giving a very general overview, and, and I'm relying on other reviewers to review that that part of the paper that I don't really know very, as much about. Um, yeah, and, 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 so, and normally, when you submit your review, there is an option to send a um, message to editor that the authors do not see, and that's mm -hmm. where you could also be exactly. 
you know, a little bit more, you know, right? Very respectful of you to the author, but to the editor, you can be a little bit more <laughs> <laughs> honest and blunt. <laughs> thing, like, like, or that's where you also can say, you know, I only reviewed the methodology and I have no idea. Yeah. In terms of the background, you know, whether people know the field yeah. or... I was not able to derive it. equation 14 <laughs> or something. Yeah, like or if they cited all the right literature, so you could say, you know, I don't know if they represented the field, you know, sort of adequately, how much right. it contributes new knowledge to the field, but the method is, is okay. fine. It's a good point. <clears throat> uh, Jared? Yeah, so my question to all three of you is for you know for the various journals that on which you serve as associate editors or editors, to what extent are either negative or even neutral results accepted or or encouraged? Because there can be there can be really important negative results or neutral results that can uh, basically serve as a warning post to everyone else in the field, okay, you don't need to, not everyone needs to waste time going down this track. But it, we don't see very many of those papers. And so how, like, I guess how do you, if, if, you, if someone has a negative or a neutral result that they think is really important to get to get into the literature, how, how would you recommend, and I, I don't have anything in mind, Personally, but like, how would you recommend to someone to make the case that I really believe this is an important paper, even though my method didn't work? But yeah, how would you handle that? I don't think many show up um, that that have that kind of situation. I think more often when you see a neutral result, the argument is that it's not a neutral result. We don't recommend that. Those ones definitely get rejected when you try to sell something that just isn't supported. Yeah. But um, but I have seen a few papers that come through and it's like, well, you know, our results are, are somewhat mixed, but there are some indications that it might matter if you had a bigger data set, whatever. You can kind of argue um, ways that it potentially could still be important, but that you couldn't statistically get you know, confidence intervals that would uh, confirm what you thought would be the result and you don't have the ability to get more data. Um, th those are still publishable. So I, I published one that was basically a neutral result. Um, it, it showed some aspects of positive signs and I would show those and then I would show that, you know, and then th there was this event that completely broke the, the paradigm. Uh, and so if you're open and honest and just say, yeah, I had some that agreed and some that didn't, I think it still has the potential to be published. Yeah. Uh, I agree, I, there's not many of them that you see, and I don't know if it's because they all get rejected in the review process, or if people just don't submit them, out of fear that they won't go through. But would, would you recommend in that case, like, I guess, probably the, the submitting author would need to kind of make a case in the cover letter, like, hey, this is what I'm, this is what I'm doing, this is, you know, why I think it's important to maybe kind of Make, try to make a pre-buttal, perhaps, I, or? I, I doubt it makes a big difference. I mean, they'll read it. I guess if you're really neutrally or wishy-washy in your abstract, that might get them concerned. Right. But um, they're probably not going to know the details of how strong or weak your arguments are. But I think as long as you just, I mean, be straightforward. And, and when you put it out to the reviewers, just you know, have some bold, bolted lists of the strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. uh, just you know, be open and see how it goes. Yeah. And that also, I think, depends on the journal, because I think, you know, some journals, so some journals may be more um, kind of receptive to papers. Let's say if it's a hypothesis-driven paper, and it's sort of a hypothesis that maybe community widely accepts, but you could prove through your work that it doesn't really hold true, then I think it's a valuable contribution. And so I think the the way you frame it, any kind of paper with a contribution to science, does it going to advance your field in one way or the other? If it does, then I would say go for it. If it, you know, kind of like, yeah, it's interesting, but maybe not that important, then maybe not worth going through the process. Yeah, and be, be very clear about the 
point of it from the, from the very start, so that somebody's not reading your paper and then halfway through they discover why you're, you're telling them that this isn't going to work. Say, like, from the first three sentences, this this paper is showing these things, and then, right. then you then the reader has that expectation. That it might go a little bit. Yeah, but I, I think it, papers like that might be more important than than the community is uh, currently, you know, valuing. Mm -hmm. Suspense and misdirection doesn't work well in, in, no. in technical writing. <laughs> Not at all. I, I, was, I was told that as a master's student, one of someone on my master's committee, someone who's fairly prominent but I won't name, uh, basically said to me, don't keep the reader in suspense. <laughs> because I, you know, I'd learned a different way of writing yeah. in college. More like creative writing, that you know, essays, that sort of thing. But it's scientific different. writing is a different beast. Transferable skills, but it's different. Yeah. But I think uh, just to expand on on your your excellent point is even in papers where you have positive results, you know, we, it's really important to the to the advancement of the science to be really honest about the limitations of these techniques and and what the challenges are and and. Okay, you know, you can say this is the typical result and show the best thing you ever got, but you know, show the show the warts too, and and I think you'll have a much stronger publication because in the end, if people use your publication as a basis for their research, they're going to find those warts anyway. So you might as well have shown them to them. You know? My my master's advisor was huge on that. Like it, it really bothered him when, you know, it was obvious that that the the study showed. Too rosy a picture, and, and there's no reason for that. Let's do Josh, then Olivia, and that's probably any question. Oh, Josh. Oh, uh, hi. Um, I was just wondering um, to follow up on a previous question about conflict of interest when deciding to review an article or not. Um, I think I think there's like different types of conflict of interest. Maybe your PhD advisor, you don't review that paper, but if it's a great personal friend, for example, because the field is relatively small, how do you go about managing that? And I guess, what's your opinions on blind reviews, like not knowing who the authors are? And if you're asked to review it and you don't think you can give a impartial review, then, then you should decline. Um, I would, I guess, be my hope. Yeah. Um, because the editor may not know that the two of you are have a, you know, a friendship or whatever, and so if you just, but if you know if, if it is a friend or a coworker, uh, maybe you know the person in the office next door to you, if you're working here at NCAR, that you get asked to review a paper for. It's happened to me, um, and you have to decide like you know can I do it? Um, if you can, do it because you're right. Good reviewers are necessary, and if you really understand the science, and you can provide. Uh, you know, a, a good review, your input is necessary. So so consider it. I think we've all reviewed friends' papers, sometimes yeah. anonymously and sometimes not. And yeah. But yeah, it's a, I think Glenn makes a great point. You have to decide whether or not you can be objective. Uh, blind review, that, that's, a, that's a big can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> right at the end. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's been experiments with a few journals um, at various places where they've tried to do that, and then there's been the exact opposite where everything is open. So um, there's some open access journals that where even the reviewers aren't blind, so they have to reveal who they are, and their exchange process uh, of the paper is completely transparent. And they actually publish your review along with the article. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's a new experiment. That's is that through like, and a journal that we may know, like AGU or something, or is it, I guess, what journals are doing that? Um, they publish your response through the review, but there's not your name. There's a couple out there, I think. Um, so there's an electronic journal, Severe Storms, that also is completely open. They include all the reviews. They only do major revisions. They don't do minor revisions, but all the major revisions and the responses are all made part of the, the final paper. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in some ways that, you know, not being able to hide as a reviewer, that definitely helps um, soften the review because yeah, if you're a complete jerk, it's going to be evident to everybody when it gets published. And so, so that that does maybe get reviewers to be a little more reasonable. Um, but is that a good thing? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. In some ways, I'm not sure whether it ultimately makes a better product or not, and I don't know how you would tell. 
And then the, the other problem can be with just um, some people are maybe just not very um, They may have preconceptions about someone because maybe it's, you know, big fish A over here and well, they wrote a paper, so it must be great. Mm -hmm. uh, and it may have serious fundamental flaws and people may have preconceptions about, oh, well, that, you know, of that person is important, so this must be a great paper. Um, but it may not be a great paper. And, and I don't think they should get some sort of advantage. They should have go through the same criteria, whether it's good or bad science. Uh, or maybe that you're, you know, a student and, and I think it can go in either way. So, you know, it could be that someone is sympathetic to the fact that this may be your first ever paper and they may be nice and want to try to help you get published so you can get started down the road of, of doing this type of work. Or they may like, oh, I'm going to pick on them. They're a student. They don't know what they're doing. I'm going to put them in their place and say, hey, you want to be published here? you got to do, you know, 90% more work than you've shown here. I don't want to see a summary of your master's thesis. Uh, so, I don't know. It, it, I think it's all over the board in terms of what you're going to get for a review. Um, yeah, I've gotten I've gotten reviews all, all across the board. I've had papers rejected. Is anybody else had papers rejected? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a good time. <laughs> um, and I've rejected papers and and also done. I've never done uh, a review where I just said accept. Um, it's never happened. Um, and, and I almost never give minor revisions, honestly. Because if you do minor revisions, at least within AMS journals, it means you don't care in whether they make the changes or not. And almost always there's something about it that you're just curious about and you may want to ask a question and say, well, what did you think about this? And, and you just want to see the response. And if you say minor, you may not see it. So, uh, so usually you'll want to say major just to get someone to talk back. But there's like major, major, and like not really major. Yeah, there's a lot of variability there. <laughs> I'll just add to that as, as a reviewer, um, I work pretty hard to get if it, if it's if it's not a great paper or, or I have you know it's not like like there's some that you just rejected immediately not very often but um, I work pretty hard to get to major because I may not have all the answers as a reviewer these people work really hard and if there's a flaw in it I might not see how they can solve that in 60 days or 90 days uh, but maybe they can and so I, I, I work I, I don't I'm pretty hesitant to to try to reject a paper because they may have an idea that I haven't thought of that will work and will make that publication a good contribution. Yeah. Can so. I clarify? You work hard to get from reject major revisions? Yeah, I work hard not to reject papers. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless it's really fundamentally flawed, um, like the statistical analysis and one that comes to mind was just wrong. And so that had to be, that had to be rejected. Yeah, and that's. It's a hard decision, I think, as yeah. an editor, because you know some papers it's very clear that you know there's just not much there. It's sloppy, you know, just mm -hmm. people didn't put much effort into it. So those are easier to reject. So if the paper, you know, proofread your papers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but if the paper, if you see like yes, it looks like it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but then I think there is sort of this trade-off, right? Because you could reject the paper. And just basically say, I think this work needs to be published, but a lot of work needs to be done before it gets published. So instead of giving you two months to fix it, you know, take some time, reconsider, yeah. Yeah. think Soft about reject. it. Soft so, reject. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, you know, and still you could just submit, but you know, you have, you know, more time. Because if you a reviewer or editor, and if you say major revisions, but you kind of on that verge of reject the major revisions. And you think they may not address your comments? That paper is going to come back to you. Yeah. And you have That's to review problem. it again. <laughs> and so, and then if they didn't address the comments then you know, you, adequately, then what you do? Then you reject it at that point, and you do another yeah. round of major revisions. And I, you know, and I've seen both. Yeah. And then you can either kind of enter this really lengthy review process, where every time authors get two months to address comments, and then you ask reviewers again to take a look at it. And so I think it may be even like more kinder option to just reject. To reject it. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. So it might save people a lot of time. I've done the soft reject. Soft reject. Yeah. So, but I think I feel like when I started as an editor, I was leaning towards more major revision because I'm like I want to give people a chance. 
And then I went towards the end and like <laughs> I was much more comfortable rejecting. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a really good point. <laughs> because they don't come back to me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Not as quick. Not as quick. <laughs> All right. Well, um, before we thank our panel, I did want to certainly thank all of you for joining us, um, both in person and online. And I wanted to announce that in two weeks time on February 27th, at the same time, we'll have another professional development workshop, this one on the ABCs of breaking bias and increasing inclusivity as well. I think for that one, we'll be in center green, but stay tuned for an announcement there. But certainly please join me in thanking our panel for joining us this morning and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.